So good morning, everybody. Um, this is a rare occasion for me to be up this early. And so um, bear with me in, in my introduction. Um, my pleasure this morning to introduce Lance Bozart. He's been a distinguished professor of meteorology forever at Albany, emeritus now, um, but still very, very active. He's been a 26-year affiliate scientist here with MQ. And um, every year he comes and visits and causes trouble for two weeks, brings his students, who you heard from last week. Um, a little of his history, he started at the Mass Institute of Technology, and his first degree was in aeronautics and astronautics. Um, and he said that at the end of that first degree, his BS, um, he was told that he really wasn't very good at, at um, constructing um, rockets. <laughs> and so they suggested maybe a different field for him, and he ended up going into meteorology, um, and it's had a distinguished career. He got his um, PhD in 1969, proving once and for all that you don't have to be a rocket scientist to be a good meteorologist. <laughs> but. Uh, Anyway, um, he has many, many uh, honors and awards. He was a fellow of the American Meteorological Society, American Association for the Advancement of Science. He got the Jewel G. Chani Award from AMS in 1992. He was the first recipient of the American Meteorological Society Teaching Excellence Award in 2002. He has all sorts of other teaching awards and so forth. Um, He's been a visitor, visiting professor and lecturer at, at MIT and University of Washington. You spent a year there um, as well. So um, without further ado, let me introduce Lance. I'm allowed to come up now, Lance? Yes. <laughs> All right, so this is, um, um, thank you for the introduction, um, Morris. Um, NCAR has been, been going to NCAR forever, it seems like. Um, so this is like a special, I'll make some comments about NCAR at the very end. Um, my co-authors, Bruno Ribeiro is my postdoc, and he's now at NSSL. And Tyler and Alexander, Tyler Light and Alexander Mitchell right there, they already gave seminars last week, so they're safe, um, <laughs> at, least, at least for now. <laughs> All right, so this is, um, the way I, I, I just, the way I do research is just, you cannot write down in a textbook and it would never tell a student how you do research because the essence of my research on the 50 year time scale is WTF, um, basic science, and you just follow your nose. And that's a lot, that's, and that's not easy because fuzzy agencies, a lot of them, for example, other than the NSF have deliverables and requirements. And so you can't deviate what you wanna do, but I'm all over the map, but anyway. So um, it was an unusually amp amp amplified upper level flow pattern over Asia during summer 1922 and facilitated extreme heat um, and storms. And what this is really, uh, I'm trying to teach myself how to think about subseasonal to seasonal prediction or S2S as it's, as it's commonly called. And when you look at that, it's like, you see all these Shakespearean bit players. In any Shakespeare novel you read, there's always a little bit player that's the key thing. And if you miss it, the whole program, everything falls apart. And that's true with S2S. And I'll say it now and I'll say it at the end. People who think we're gonna be able to forecast detailed weather on, two, on week two and beyond are on, on la la land um, right now in terms of all those kinds of details. Ed Lorenz was right way back then and he's still right now in terms of day to day. But maybe we can understand some of the patterns and one way to start that is to see how a lot of severe weather events and our extreme weather events can be linked. So there was a record-breaking heat wave in the UK during much of Western Central Europe during June and July of 2022. An impressive US severe weather style outbreak, a serial uh, derecho brought to you by the Kellogg Serial Company, occurred over parts of Southern Europe on August 18th, 19th, 2022. Eurasian trough and Bay of Bengal depressions facilitated record-breaking flooding in Pakistan in August 2022. And these distinctive meteorological events will be discussed from a subseasonal to seasonal um, perspective. All right, so let's start out with the heat wave in the summer. 
So this is a pouch from the European ECMWF. This is a European surface air temperature anomaly during June, July, and August, uh, going back to 1980. And, um, and you see the reference period is 1991 for 2020 for the, um, for the mean and the anomaly. So you can see the steadily warming in the, uh, through this record, the 2022 one was over 1.2 degrees C above the baseline um, during that period. So the signal of climate warming is everywhere. And there, and in England, in the UK, a uh, na new national temperature record. I mean, look at that, 40.3 C on, on July 19th, 2022. That, at that latitude, that is just incredibly warm um, in there. And if you look at, uh, say, the 850 millibar temperature anomaly uh, for June and July on the right, June on the left, you can see remarkably persistence um, with the core of the warmth over the Western Europe, uh, UK, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, centered over Corsica at this time, then moving a little bit westward um, in that. So there was a very persistent warm period during the summer of 2022. And looking more broadly in July, heat waves and fires scorch Europe, Africa, and Asia. Um, you can see the anomalies here, the scale down here and the, and the, and the air temperature um, uh, in here, uh, remarkable heat all, along, all, all over the place in there. And those are just a sampling of some of the uh, record temperatures that occurred during that particular period. And if you look, I found, I figured out what the hottest day was for the summer day in July, in, July, in the summer of 2022, it was July 19th in Western Europe. And these anomalies in here in Celsius in through here are in the 12 to 16 degree C range. That's a rather remarkable uh, positive temperature anomaly for that, that time of the year. And so it should not surprise that when you look at, say, on July 19th, the standardized uh, 250 millibar wind speed anomalies are on the left, and the standardized 500 millibar height anomalies are on the right, and you have remarkably amplified flow, so you've got some very strong ridges and flanking troughs, and the standardized wind speed anomalies are here to three to four, so this is a re remarkably strong ridge, and also the wind speed that's in it. Um, and then the other side in the 500 millibar height anomalies here, again, you're in the three to two and a half to three sigma range, but a very, very strong uh, and very persistent ridge um, during that period. So the, the secret of meteorology going forward is study ridges. They're not going away. And as we were talking the, before the start of the seminar, there's a mother of all ridges forecast by the GFS coming up in the extended range. And if you look at the 700 millibar precipitable water anomalies and uh, um, on the left and standardized temperature anomalies on the right. Um, what you can see on the flank, on the western flank of the ridges, there's co uh, corridors of uh, high, uh, anomalously high precipitable water that's affected poleward. And similarly on the head of the trough on the back of the ridge that's on this side. And this little temperature anomaly here in the, in the purple, that's between five and six degrees sigma um, maximum temperature anomaly in, in, in parts of Europe. So just remarkable heat. Stepping back to look at the surface air temperature anomaly for August now in the big picture in through here. Yeah, we've got the heat, um, but in the Pakistan region here where it was raining, it was suppressed. But don't forget this signal. Below North, we're in a few places below normal, Eastern uh, uh, Russia in through here, and then the Tibetan plateau and into China um, above normal. So North-South temperature gradient unusually strong, think that impact that has on the jet stream. And we'll talk about that in a second. So the key takeaways at this point, um, July 22, European hot spell persisted through August. Persistent ridging was associated with anomalously amplified flow, and the amplified flow enabled, which we'll talk about next, Saharan air to reach much of Western Europe. All right, part two, Central European severe weather outbreak of 18, 19, August 2022. All right, so the scenes like this, boats washed ashore, um, things that are disrupted, commerce disrupted in the streets. That was in Venice. And my favorite is this. This is not supposed to be Europe. This is what Howie sees on the, on the, on the high plains. I saw this once in Western Kansas. And you know, this was like the mother of all, you know, end of the world when you see this on, on the plains, it's like, do we have insurance on our rental car? Um, there's going to be some hail, and we're in, you know, deep, you know what. Um, um, and maybe Reed Timmer will go there, but anyway. Um, so that, but that's not supposed to happen in Europe, but there it was. Um, 
appeared to be driven by unusually strong upper-level forcing for ascent immediately east of a prominent upper-level trough. Another worked, worked just there like it does here. Strong deep convection developed down shear of the aforementioned upper-level trough and moved rapidly to the north-northeast. And strong maximum wind gusts indicated that appreciable downward horizontal momentum transfer augmented convectively generated downdrafts. Okay, uh, I asked Steve West, Weiss to look at, I, get his opinion. I respect Steve highly. Um, when, when, you, when, when he was working at the Storm Prediction Center in Norman, when, he, when Steve was on duty, you know you, you, had, the, you had the top of the, the best of the best um, on, the, on the case, which you wanted when there was something, all hell was breaking loose. And his comment was, my sense this event may be classified as a serial derecho. It appeared to be driven by intense large-scale forcing immediately east of an upper level low with convective elements moving rapidly to the north, northeast or northeast. The strength of the reported maximum wind gusts also suggests downward transfer of background horizontal momentum augmented that convectively generated downdrafts. Okay, so there are some of the reports from the European Center database and you can see coming up across Corsica into Central Europe and then all the way up into uh, northern, northern Germany um, in there, during that period. This is what it looked like in a satellite imagery. Um, at that time, this is on the 18th of August, and through here, maximum wind at, at this, uh, in this depiction, this is from the weather base at the European Center, um, peak wind, a uh, European storm agency, severe storm agency, excuse me, um, deaths were their 12 provisional path length was over 800 kilometers, peak wind gusts to 224 kilometers per hour, 139 miles per hour. That's not chop change, chop liver or whatever the term you want to use for it in there. Now, the maximum wind speeds over Corsica, Corsica got really slammed in through here. Um, peak wind speed was 224 kilometers per hour in there. The Mediterranean sea surface temperatures were three to five degrees C above normal, and that helped to increase the derecho intensity. And here's a, a, a BOEC evolution, six zero and six Z, so six hour apart in through here over Corsica. So you can see the Boeing in, in through here as, it, as it's moving northward in through here. Um, and let's see, the center part of the BOEX will accelerate to an incredible speed of 40 to 50 meters per second. You don't have a lot of time to get out of the way when, you're when things are moving that fast. Um, compared to a mean wind speed of 17 meters per second, which suggests the presence of very strong rear inflow jet. Um, and the storm moved in the direction of the zero to three kilometer shear vector, i.e. in the direction of the strongest lift along the, uh, along the cold pool. Uh, that was, those are some of the information that prompted Steve Weiss to declare the, uh, uh, what he did about that event. Now time moves downward and increases downward in through here. So you can see the um, t overshooting top development in through here. And these are really, really big, 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 big events, especially um, for Europe. Now, one of the interesting things I, I, I used to the NOAA high split model to come to calculate some backward trajectories in through here. And what, you, what you've got, you've got sources of air over the Sahara. So in effect, you have an elevated mixed layer when you get to Corsica, here you have an elevated mix layer, but it forms in a different way from, uh, from, the, from on the plains here, because you're coming over the Mediterranean. So you've got surface deep, steep lapse rates that are surface-based coming off the Sahara. Then they move over the Mediterranean, and even though the Mediterranean is very warm, the lowest layer of the atmosphere is cooled, so you wind up with a temperature inversion and an elevated mix layer. But the elevated mix layer came about because of cooling from the surface of the ocean, uh, um, which is a little different than what happens here in this particular case, which is rather interesting. And if you look at, say, some of the, some of the soundings in here, you can, it's hard to see the details. These are A, B, C, but I, I put the numbers over here for, the, for reference. You see the zero to six kilometer shear at points A, B, and C there, 25 meters per second, everything above 20 meters, 20 meters per second. Storm relative humidity in the zero to three kilometers range, um, minimum at sea 192 meters squared per second to a maximum of 358. And the Cape values um, were all kind of over the, A was only 504 joules per kilogram, but B, 2719. So you see you have the, you have the right ingredients for um, an important severe weather outbreak um, in that region. Now what does it look like when we, um, how am I doing at time? When we look at the uh, maps in through here, 
So the left-hand side is the 850 millibar map and through here to Cape. And so you're in this region, the red, so you're at three, over 3, 000, 3 to 4,000 uh, joules per kilogram of Cape um, in here. And if you look at 500 millibars, you've got this, for this time of the year in this location, if you know your climatology, this is one hell of a, of a, of a, a temperature anomaly, I mean height anomaly in that, in that area. That's an unusually um, deep trough in through here. And the blue shading is where the asset is um, in through here. This is off Alicia Bentley's map file in through here. So you've got an anomalously deep trough and that southerly flow out ahead of it is what enabled the, the surface-based Saharan air to come across the Mediterranean and get entrained into the, uh, the forward flank of the, of the storm. And if we look at, at again at 12Z, left is the heights and winds and precipitable water anomalies. So in the red here, on the forward side of the trough, you have a lot of reds going all the way up to Scandinavia on the west side of, the, of, of this big ridge. And those precipitable water anomalies are in the two to three sigma range. And if you look at the A50 millibar temperatures in through here, again, in the reds, two to three sigma on the forward side of the trough, all the way up and around around this big massive ridge, which will be very important, what we're gonna talk about next with Pakistan. Okay, so now the 700 millibar heights and anomalies and 850 temperatures again. This is on the 20th of August, two days later. So you can see the moisture is continuing to surge, uh, standardized principal waters up and around the ridge and the 850 millibar heights and the anomaly of the warmth moves off again in that direction, and I think I have one more. This is on the 22nd of August. And again, it's starting to weaken, but you see the corridor that was established of the transport of moisture poleward, and then again, up and around, uh, and the very warm air coming up and around um, the Big Ridge. But the trough lifted out to the northeast and weakened as it moved up around the ridge. Now that had implications because you may remember the, this um, event, the, lead, the top two directors of the Hungarian Weather Service were fired because the day of that event was a national holiday and they forecast, they used continuity, they recognized the very deep trough that we just talked about to the south and they assumed that was gonna, on a national holiday, major national holiday, it was gonna impact Hungary and so they made an alarming forecast and nothing much happened because the system weakened as it lifted north up on the back side of the ridge. And so what happened to go? The top two people were fired from the job to which I couldn't resist. Perhaps they were fired for not being sharp enough to borrow a time-tested, TC-tested Sharpie pen from you know who. And it's just funny that in the, where the Sharpie issue was again in the news today from you know who. But anyway, so that was... <laughs> And if you don't know who that is, you're not paying attention you know, who that person will be referring to, who shall not be named. All right, so key takeaways. Serial derecho occurred in conjunction with unusually intense progressive upper level trough over the Mediterranean. So check one, you have to know your climatology to recognize an unusually intense trough when you see one. Severe weather environment was characterized by zero to six kilometer bulk shear values, bulk shear values near 25 meters per second and Cape values greater than 1,500 joules per kilogram. Uh, serial derecho lasted for 13 hours, had a path length longer than 800 kilometers, and maximum reported wind speed of 224 kilometers per hour. The presence of Saharan, Saharan air and steep lapse rates above 900, uh, 900 hectopascal likely contributed to evaporatively cooled strong ground drafts. Uh, downstream upper level ridge building enabled an anomalously strong jet trough to form downstream north of Pakistan. The implications of that are coming next. And a quasi persistent anomalous amplified flow pattern prevailed across Europe and North Africa during July and August. And this is an S2S problem. Um, and trying to anticipate it in advance it has huge implications when you think on S2S timescales. All right, part three, the last part, uh, Pakistan flooding in August 2022. Uh, remarkable, uh, the amount of damage, uh, damage 10% of gross domestic prospect, that's amazing. 202 million homes destroyed or damaged, worst floods since 20, 10, 2020, uh, 2010, 10 to 12% of the country was flooded, just remarkable. Here are some examples of what you see, um, flooding everywhere. 
And the cumulative rainfall here, this is during the 12th to 26th August period, um, shows that it extends pretty much over the entire, um, entire uh, country. I'll show you, what the, I have a loop next to really drive that point home once I can get it to go. This will be a miracle if it works. There it goes. Watch how the rain just accumulates. And whether you can see, there's synoptic control of that. You can see how it just progresses northward across the country on a corridor, and then it moves westward. Let's see, can I play that one more time? I'm maybe pushing my luck here. Let's see what happens. Yeah, all right. So you get to see what's, um, what's happening. There's there are local rain, and then there's, this, there's clearly synoptic organization that's in, in, involved as well as with mesoscale structure in here. You've got the mix of both going on. All right, so the end result in Pakistan flood map, pretty much the entire country from south to north. Um, so there's always heavy rain and some local flooding every monsoon season in Pakistan. But what was extraordinary about this event was pretty much the entire country was involved, which consisted with the rainfall time series on the map that I just showed you. Oh, so the rainfall anomaly just for August in through here you can see approaching in the blues and through here, two, th uh, 152 to 300 uh, millimeters for, just for the anomaly. And basically what doesn't get talked about was over here is a drought. So basically this was the end run pattern um, and through here, drought over there. Okay, so mean and anomaly precipitable water in through here. Um, the maximum value in here, the, the purples, you're into the 55s, you're into the 60. The maximum value in here is about 66 millimeters in through here. And the anomaly here, the inner core in here is over 24 millimeters. So this is really, really juiced up um, air um, in this region being pulled northward into upward across Pakistan. So what is associated with that? And on the right, you can see the anomaly. I just, just mentioned what it was. Now. This is, to me, this is one of the most interesting things. First of all, if you know your climatology, there's not supposed to be a 50 meter per second plus jet streak north of Pakistan in the summertime. No, it doesn't happen. And if you don't know your climatology, you don't know what you're looking at. And the anomaly is about 30 meters per second. So the anomaly looks very much like the jet pattern, which shows you how, odd this was, and then, and if you remember your jet streak businesses, and you think, hmm, we have an equator with jet entrance region here, north of Pakistan, and northwest India, might that be something that you should be paying, paying attention to? All right, so, here's the time mean, uh, mean an anomaly, 250 millibar heights um, for 16th, 28th of August. So this is the big ridge which associated with the severe weather outbreak in Western Europe on the back side of this thing. And you can see that there's a very strong east-west oriented ridge in through here, and that's the anomaly pattern sitting right here, but a rather deep trough up there. I pointed out earlier this was the blue area where there was some actually below normal temperatures, and that is in that trough. So if you've got below normal heights up here, above normal heights down there, that's what's driving the strong, anomalously strong jet um, to the north of the Tibetan Plateau in through here, which is a player in what happened. Okay, so these are two different time periods, 4th to 13th August and 14 to, uh, um, 14 to 23rd August on the right in through here. So you can see during this period, what happened is the ridge to the west that was there back in June it was very persistent and moved around, but very persistent, amplified further, and then downstream of that, the trough deepened, but the ridge held, and so where's the jet exit entrance region gonna be? It's bottom been here. Okay. Now, what about westward moving Bay of Bengal depressions, which tap tropical moisture? They're on there. This happens all the time, every year. In India, Bay, Bay of Bengal number six on the left and number five on the right. I should have put them reverse, but that's okay. Um, so these the systems, this is, these are the rainmakers that imp impact India. Basically, want to be tropical cyclones that want to form here. They usually don't get more than a tropical storm status when they reach land 
um, uh, and then move west or across India, west, northwest, or towards Pakistan, and produce a ton of rain. And one thing that I think I haven't had a chance to look at, but Carrie Emanuel wrote this paper back in um, annual 2008, an hypothesis for the redevelopment of warm core cyclones over northern Australia. It was in the monthly weather view. The idea that you could get over very heated, dry soil when it starts to rain, it changes the fluxes out of the boundary layer and can, su and can support um, tropical storm formation, at least the tropical depression type formation. To what extent that may be a, a factor in what happened in Pakistan, I don't know, but it shouldn't be dismissed out of hand and it should be looked at. Um, it's, the terminology for that is the so-called brown ocean uh, effect. So that's just something I want to put out there because if I was in, looking at this a little bit further, we need to think about that. Kerry is always ahead of everybody else anyway, so you should be paying attention. When Kerry writes something, just pay attention to it. Now, how about New Delhi? I could not find a signing, sounding for Pakistan anywhere, but here's a New Delhi sounding um, on the zero Z on the 22nd of August and through here. Precipitable water, the mind blowing 63.56 millimeters. And so, you know, all right, you're way off to the right, it's moist, deep moisture. But what impresses me is deep warm air advection from the ground, veering wind profile up to 300 millibars. So you've got some element of synoptic control um, in all of this. So let's look at the integrated water vapor transport in Eurasia and through here. So you're going to look at, show you some, uh, how am I doing in time? So we're going to show you some maps um, in here that will the 700 millibar reanalysis, the heights in through here, and the wa integrated water vapor transport, and the first gray is 1,200 units, so that's a lot of moisture. And so from the Arabian Sea, you get these westward moving disturbances, but on the south side of these westward moving disturbances, you've got lots of moisture coming in from the Arabian Sea. And these things steadily move across India, Every year, um, they form and they move westward, and some of them contribute to rainfall in Pakistan, depending upon the season. Um, that's the 10th of August, the 8th on the left, so those maps are 48 hours apart. Here are the next two, 12 and 14 August, 48 hours apart. You can see this one is moving westward. Again, the surge, but then here comes the next. This one is dying out on the west, and here comes the next one that forms in the uh, uh, to the east and then moves westward across um, northern India. And if we take a time out and look at 12Z and the 15th and look at um, what's going on in here, precipitable waters are greater than 60 millimeters into the, the shading here. You've got a few isolated cases where the analysis is pushing over 70 millimeters. I mean, 70 millimeters of precipitable water, you might as well be taking a bath in public because that's basically what you're dealing with. Um, in there. So da juice, uh, widespread precipitable val water values uh, greater than 60 millimeters. And so this gives some sort of lifting mechanism for this kind of air mass, what's going to happen? It's going to rain, big time. Back to the te temporary interruption with that, back to the 18th, 16th, here's that Bay of Bengal depression now moving westward over northwestern India. And then it starts to die out as it approaches Pakistan. And then it comes the next one entering stage right, uh, moving to the west. And then 20th and 22nd. And then there's a temporary pause. This is the last one for a while. And there's the original run that had weakened. And here comes the next one. But for the time being, instead of a, another one coming, there's TC action in the West Pack. It is, after all, August. And then finally, in the last two that are in the 24th and 26th. So those are normal features of the atmosphere. These produce a lot of rain across India, and they come into Pakistan, and they can produce heavy rain in Pakistan. So what was the bonus added extra, if you will, in through here? So let's look at uh, synoptic overview, mid-level flow in Cape Shear. So on the 20th of August, here's your trough, deepening trough towards Pakistan. Um, vectors in through here, Cape Shear, so you can see all the juices down here, all the shears up and through here. But right near the northern edge and through here, 
there's, you're right on the borderline with the strong shear to the north. But basically, most of the rain is staying to the south of the shear. So these are not like, uh, this is not like a widespread rainstorm that's supported by a strong shear environment. But it's very close to a very a strong shear environment. But there's going to be another factor in through here as we watch that trough. That's, that's on the 20th of August, four days later. Note that ridge, which was present since the end of June, basically, in through here, his trough has sharpened up and has deepened southeastward. The blue, at, blue uh, the ascent at uh, 700 millibars in through here. And this is, you now have an equator with jet entrance region getting dangerously close to this surge of moisture up and through here, which suggests that there's some degree, uh, some degree which, needs to be, which needs to be quantified of organization going on, because they're not supposed to be a trough like that in this part of the world. Here's the 24th of August, my birthday, um, in through here. And so you've got a really remarkable cutback um, system in through here. And look at some of the shear values to the north. 60 knots? Are you kidding me? Um, in through here with 60 knots with 60, uh, 70 precipitable water values? Oh, my heavens. 26th of August, this is um, the last one in through here with that very, very deep trough. We're getting going to be reinforced coming down along the ridge and in a further one eastern in China. Okay, so let's talk about, to wrap, start wrapping up, let's talk about synoptic overview and governing dynamics. I'm going to show you some maps that look like this. Standardized 250 millibar wind speed anomalies. That's on the 12th of, 12Z on the 15th of August. Um, there's, there's a big jet. So India's over here. So you've got that big ridge we've talked about uh, quite a bit by now and weaker, but this is an easterly jet. The Tibetan Plateau was a big heat source in through here, very warm, and you have an easterly jet now, as well as a westerly jet in through here. Where is the exit region, left exit region of the easterly jet? Right here, over northern Pakistan. So my goodness. And that's the uh, 700 millibar heights in precipitable water. So here's the plume in through here, you've gone off the charts on, six mil, on the Six Sigma in through here. So all this moisture is coming up um, right out of the Arabian Sea, right up in through here, underneath the jets, the easterly jet, and then into the westerly jet. All right, so what about 18th of August? Standardized anomalies at 500 millibar heights. Not surprisingly, above normal here. Here's one of the remnants, one, remnants of the westward propagating disturbances. Deep trough here. The annoying ridge that's been there all summer long. Colder than normal here, warmer than normal here. Anomalously strong gradient compared to the time of the year. But watch what happens on the left panel as we move forward 48 hours, 20th of August. Note how it's dropping southward. I'll go back to see how the, west, how the trough deepens to the southwest and gets closer and closer um, in through here uh, towards Pakistan. So now where is the jet entrance region going to be? It's going to be here. It's coming towards northern Pakistan. You've got a jet crater with jet entrance region. And if you look at it in terms of uh, uh, irritational winds and 250 millibar winds, irritational wind vectors and precipitable water, you've got negative PV advection by the irritational wind in here, outflow over the Tibetan plateau, and a very, very strong PV gradient associated with that on the 20th of August, which continues if you go forward to the 21st of August at 18Z. Again, look at the interaction of the PV gradient with negative PV advection by the irrotational wind in here, which is helping to tighten the gradient and strengthen that jet um, to the north. So you've got a very unusual situation of jet dynamics coinciding with the active phase of the Indian monsoon. And standardized anomalies of sea level pressure confirms what you expect with the trough. You've got well above normal uh, sea level pressures to the north of the Tibetan Plateau and one of the westward moving disturbances in through here. And so that is reinforcing the overall easterly gradient. And so some conclusions here before I sum up. Uh, unusually intense a Mediterranean trough associated with severe weather was a catalyst for downstream flow amplification across Eurasia. 
Strong upper level ridge over Eastern Europe arising from flow amplification resulted in the formation of a deep upper level trough over Central Asia. Um, the trough over Central Asia facilitated westward and northward directed moisture transport from the Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea toward India and Pakistan. Jet entrance and jet exit region di like dynamics likely facilitated heavy rainfall in parts of Pakistan. Very rare for August. I can't emphasize enough the importance of paying attention to jet entrance and exit region dynamics in this particular event. And understanding the structure and evolution of Pakistan's summer rainfall patterns on S2S timescales requires linking weather and climate. You just can't do it by climate alone and weather alone. All right, a concluding comment here. Um, I have an excerpt, excerpt from a Randall Emanuel 2024 paper on the weather climate schism. Uh, this is very important. I cannot over, overemphasize the importance of what Kerry has in here, uh, what Randall and, Dave Randall and Kerry Emanuel have. The atmospheric science community includes both weather and climate scientists. These two grid, inner groups interact much less than they should, particularly in the United States. The schism is widespread and has persisted for 50 years or more. It has found that academic departments, laboratories, professional societies, and even funding agencies. Mending the schism would promote better, faster science. We sketch the history of the schism and suggest ways to make our community whole. This is a critically important paper to read. And I would argue that NCAR in particular can play a very important role in trying how to figure out how to way to remedy this, this situation. Because the problem fundamentally is climate scientists first like to think statistically, whereas weather scientists like me first like to think dynamically. I don't like thinking statistically, I like to understand the dynamics. The climate scientists will equally say we need to think statistically to get all these equations and all the, what's going on. You need to do both. You can't just think statistically or dynamically. When you go to S2S timescales, it requires linking the dynamics with what's going on and understanding the statistical aspects of everything. How are we going to do this given that problem? And this is a very accurate problem. Go look at all your various academic departments. Climate scientists want nothing to do with weather scientists. Weather scientists want nothing to do with climate scientists. That's not gonna work, folks, if we're gonna make any it, um, advances. Now, since this could very well be the last time I'm giving a seminar at NCAR, I wanna have an NCAR retrospective, and I have to um, give a tribute to Jean Adams. Um, Jean was a remarkable woman and she had a summer program in scientific computing that she started in 1966. I was in the second class, which is in 1967, and there were eight of us. That's me. And Carr insisted that we wear white shirts and ties. Several of us, including me, had no white shirts. So what did we do? We went to some local store and bought the cheapest shirt, knowing that once you put it in the washer, it would probably disintegrate, but it was okay for the purpose of the pictures. And these stupid, long, narrow ties. Clearly one of us, one of the group, didn't get the memo um, that, that was sent out. Um, that's Gene Abbs' gang of eight. So what did she do? We had computer instruction in Fortran. Gene Adams, it was a ex remarkable woman, um, the eight of us, and she wrote her, we, we, we had instruction from about 8.30 to 12 in the morning, and then in the afternoon we were free, and we were assigned to work with NCAR scientists, and uh, we all were working on our theses and things like that, but we, everything was Fortran, Fortran based in learning how to do coding, and she was remarkably good at that, um, in teaching us how to, how to do these things, and, um, this is from, she was born in Utica, New York, of all places. Um, and she, she is just remarkable um, history in through here. Just look at her professional experience in through here. Remarkable. And she never got the respect back then where the way things were that she should have, had, she should have gotten the respect. Um, she had just all remarkable stuff. And she was very patient with us and taught us all kinds, all kinds of stuff to, um, um, to do. And um, I'm just, in, uh, just amazed that NCAR, for the most part, until very recently, 
I've been bugging NCAR for years that you need, NCAR needs to do something to recognize Jean Adams' program and the impact of what she did 50 years ago and the, who emerged from her program um, to do this. Um, Fred Sanders at MIT called my attention to her program in 1967. She, he said, this is something you might uh, be interested in. So I said, oh, okay. Um, that sounded interesting. What's this NCAR? <laughs> this was, Mesa Lab only opened in 1966. Um, so I applied. I was the only one who applied from MIT. I don't know why, but no one else applied, but I applied and, and got accepted um, and schlepped off the boulder and, and the interstate highway wasn't, system wasn't finished yet and I stopped in Brooklyn, Iowa. Just because of the name, I had to say, what's Brooklyn, Iowa look like? Well, I can tell you it was a small town and they, they said, we would like to, would you, we would want you to marry one of our daughters in town. They tried to say, why don't you set up shop here? We have all these women, you, we, need, you, we need young people. We can't get young people in Brooklyn, Iowa. I said, well, I know a lot of young people in Brooklyn, New York, but anyway. So that was like, okay, this is very interesting when you go into the Midwest um, in there. And, but on her, from on her website in through here, she passed away on April 21st, 2007 at age 85, uh, worked at NCAR beginning in the 1960s until her retirement in 1997. She was the pioneer in the computer field, getting her start with early machines during World War II. At NCAR, she worked on what's now called CISL, CISL developing and teaching short courses on scientific programming. Program guides in Fortran 90, uh, chaired the National Institute of Standard Committee that developed programming language. She was also past chair of the International Programming Languages Committee on International Standards and Organization. I mean, just look at this. Why isn't there more recognition of what Gene Adams did here at NCAR? Um, it just has to be. Gene Adams' student program was a terrific benefit to NCAR because the students became friends of NCAR and later, many of them developed into administrators, professors, and researchers in the atmospheric and related sciences, says retiree Paul Schwarztrauber, uh, who worked with Jean for 30 years. Jean will also be remembered for the field trip she organized for summer program participants, hikes up Mount Audubon, picnics at Bear Lake. She had a cabin at Bear Lake, about 9,500 feet. Back in those days, when we first got there, there was still snow all over the place. Uh, not anymore um, in late June. Uh, her husband, uh, Merrill, was a CU professor, accompanying her in most of these activities. Just re absolutely um, remarkable, and it's really a shame um, that, she, that uh, and Sarah Swanson, uh, I've been talking with her now for a bit, um, and I think NCAR is finally uh, waking up to the, that we need to really do something to, to recognize Gene. So I have to make a, um, a personal tribute to NCAR, uh, given that this may be the last time I'm here. Um, for 50, uh, so it goes, spans uh, 57 years. That should be 1967. I don't know what typo there. Uh, Gene Adams opened the do NCAR doors to Clueless Me in 1967. Um, I, we, we were assigned to people, to scientists to work with, in, like in the afternoons to test our, our programming stuff. So I was assigned to work with, whoops, I think there's a problem here. Is this, is this still working? I should put it back. Okay, um, I was assigned to work with Chester Newton, Ed Danielson, and T. T. N. Uh, Krishnamurti. Chester Newton, giant in the field. So, and he had all these maps, hand-drawn maps that were in the NCAR library. On Sunday, no, Saturday, Tyler and Alex and I were up at the, in the, uh, the NCAR looking in the library, in the new rebuilt library in there. I looked in all the drawers, I could not find where those maps are. I hope they were not thrown away because of the very uh, historic importance of, of some of the hand analyses that uh, Chester did. But um, he, of course, Chester knew Bjorkness and Solberg. And so was, I felt really connected to the giants in the field because through Chester. And later, um, Chester then uh, got me, uh, what was I going to say? He arm twisted me to be an editor of Monthly Weather Room, which I, uh, which I did for uh, three years um, in there. And it's interesting that Chester uh, and Dick Reed and Fred Sanders um, were all practically the same age and giants all in, in there. And 
Um, Ed Danielson, I was assigned to work with, he told me about isentropic trajectories. How do isentropic trajectories? Well, he was here at NCAR. And Krishnamurti from Florida State University came because the NCAR had the only super computer, the CDC 6600. That was the supercomputer that was the fastest machine around. People came from all over the country to NCAR to use the uh, supercomputer. And Krishnamurti was um, almost, come to say, he either came two or three times a month and he adopted me uh, into, his, into his group because uh, he respected Fred Sanders so much. And, and you, you never know where these things, where these things go um, in there. Uh, many years later, I, I found out later when I got the AMS Charney Award, it was Krishnamurti who nominated me. And that, no, I was with Krishnamurti when I was still a gra graduate student and uh, learning from all these people. So you never know where things are gonna go. And I also need to, was, Multiple ASP colloquia as a participant, as a co-organizer. Morris and I, and I re organized and ran this rollicking severe storms colloquium with yellow and red cards for people like Howie. <laughs> I'm still mad at you, Howie, for getting a red card that I thought I deserved. Now, Morris only gave me a yellow card for a bad joke, but anyway. <laughs> Um, NCAR, and NCAR M cube scientists visit U Albany, um, like Morris multiple times, Chris Davis and Rich Rotuno, uh, and many invaluable scientific in insights have come from those. And the NCAR affiliate, sci affiliate scientist visitor benefits my graduate students, Alex and Tyler, and graduate students this visit, Alex and Tyler. So I've been able to bring students and let them get into the NCAR atmosphere in through here, and just a couple of pictures. Um, the 1997 Cyclone Workshop in Valmarin, Quebec. It was, a, it was the occasion of the 75th birthday of Chester Newton, right here, Dick Reed, right here, and Fred Sanders, right here. All 75 years old in, in the same year. And we had a special, the Cyclone Workshop of that year um, was devoted to uh, uh, celebrating their intellectual achievements and what it meant um, for the field. And a 50 plus year retrospective on NCAR. Um, NCAR rose to international prominence on the strength of curiosity driven basic research. Basic research is an intellectual gift that keeps on giving and is what old timers like me celebrate as invaluable about NCAR. Uh, and an increasing emphasis on pursuit of applied research dollars risks throwing out the intellectual baby with the applied bathwater. Um, I'm getting myself in trouble, but I don't care. Uh, budding young scientists in the room and elsewhere need support for curiosity-driven basic research as envisioned in the NCAR charter. And NCAR follow the, money, follow the applied money strategy, strategy risk deviating future basic research, devaluing future basic research, and may hurt the next generation of science. And my analysis is EOF, extremely old fart, me, and uh, I'll be off to the nearest bomb shelter very shortly um, in here. Now, NCAR um, going forward, this is the next to last slide. While the A in NCAR stands mostly for atmosphere, as in follow the science, will the A in NCAR stand mostly as in follow the science, or will the A in NCAR stand mostly for applied, as in follow the money? Q. Roberts Frost's famous poem, The Road Not Taken. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in the wood, in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. And that's, I think, an argument for basic research, always supporting basic research, because you don't know what's gonna happen. And that's the deep, big difference between basic research and applied research. NCAR is supposed to be a place for basic research uh, broadly across the field. But I understand the pressures of funding. Deliverables with exchange for money are irresistible sometimes, particularly when there are, are tight budget cuts. And one last little point there, Willie Sutton. Why do I put Willie Sutton in there? Willie Sutton was a famous bank robber in New York many, many years ago. And he, uh, he kept getting, he never shot anybody or did it in violence, but he always went in disguise and robbed banks. And there was this famous scene and the reporter asked him, Willie, why do you keep robbing banks? And his answer was precious. He said, well, 
That's where they keep the money, you moron. <laughs> in there. But that's, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of thing. The money, you know, follow the money. What are we going to do um, about that in order to sort of keep the balance between basic and applied research so that applied research doesn't take over? This is the National Center, damn it. It should be for research um, in through here. And it should be supportive of young people because people like me benefited when I was much your age from being an NCAR. And you should have the same opportunities that I had. It's just not right if we don't do that. Okay, well, I think I have one more. So, um, last slide. There's this mural in the main, on the Mesa Lab, which was covered up during the, during the pandemic, was a, which was just blasphemy to cover the, with that stupid security thing up at, uh, uh, on the Mesa Lab and all that thing that blocked the whole bottom part of this mural that Mel Shapiro drew by hand. It's, it simulates tropopause folding. And I remember when he was painting this thing, he was up on this ladder. Up, this is a real, you know, there's uh, Tyler and, and Alex in, in through here. We took this picture, I took this picture on Saturday. We were up at the Mesa Lab. Mel's up here painting this thing. And it's like, I'm, Mel, this is a big, huge ladder. He never fell off the ladder. Um, but it, it, it illustrates, and it's kind of, I didn't plan it that way, but here's the tropopause fold and the PV thinking pouring down into, Alex and Tyler. I didn't think of it. That was just a pure accident. It's setting it up. It's only when I looked at it, which looked at it later, um, that happened. So you've heard enough from me. <clears throat> so thank you. Lots of opportunity for questions here. We'll start down here. Hold on. Let me give you the mic so the people outside can hear. Hi, George. Fantastic <laughs> talk. I agree with um, everything uh, you said at the end there. And I was just wondering if you looked into how numerical guidance did uh, for, in particular, the Pakistan floods and how no. far out um, that, that was called. No, that's an obvious next step. This is what, this is what, this was a WTF kind of project. Um, Oh, I should put holding. Oh, no, you can no, still hear. Okay. 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 Um, in there. No, that's a very good question, George. I haven't looked at it. I've been trying to really understand how the various players work when you start looking at time scales of one or two months um, in through here and how the ridges keep getting rebuilt and how, how that impacts everything. And um, it, it, when I do something like this, I really appreciate now why S2S is the way forward in there. But how we do this, if you, if you can't really get to S2S and understand what's going on unless you look at the weather and understand the dynamics of, of the whole system, you just can't approach this problem statistically. You're not gonna understand what's happening if you just do it entirely statistically. You can't. You have to look at the dynamics. So, but you make a good point. Yes. No, I was gonna say there's uh, some comments on Hold on. Oh. Yeah. Oh, lots of comments on the... Uh, Okay, let's start with on the board here, Laura Pan. Great to hear your talk. We conducted the Asian Summer Monsoon Chemical and Climate Impact Project campaign with two high flyers, NCAR G5 and NASA, from Korea over Western Pacific in August 2022. The large anomaly we observed, eastward extension of monsoon anticyclone and the Three Sigma and Greater East Asia Monsoon facilitated observation of record-breaking effective transport of a very short ozone. Where's the question? These are related events to what you are showing from the eastern side of the system. And thank you for speaking about NCAR. Okay, no bombs yet. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? One, one comment I or observations I made is that, the, again, it seemed like the large scale pattern was quite persistent, but the actual events were much more mesoscale. Um, which yeah, I think synoptic is, events within a large scale envelope of what's going on. So you have right. to think across the scales. Right, yeah. <laughs> but you, you can't ignore the, the mesoscale. Of course the not. Scale. You can't ignore any of the scales. That's, right. that's the thing. Yeah. yeah. Any other comments? 
Great presentation. So I had a I had a quick question. I know, especially in the S2S community recently, causal analysis has been something that they're trying to dive a little bit deeper into, um, trying to take an event like the Pakistan floods and work their way back on what caused this. And it seems like there were quite a few players. And I guess my question is, do you do you find that fitting methodology or, you know, are you just going to end up going back into the weeds to the point where, you know, you're kind of getting lost, um, you know, for, for people doing this kind of work, you know, how far back is it worth going, um, both in time and in the, in the dynamics? Well, in terms of, of how far back to go, that's always the question because you, you, I, when I started looking at this, this was purely, purely WTF research. I started looking at this and I started looking in August because that's when the heaviest rain. Then I quickly realized that I need to look in July and that I needed to look in June. Um, and then I started, I said, do I need to look back in May? And I looked, no. Um, the pattern, sort of the, the beginnings of the first strands of a theme of a, you know, a, a good symphony in the first movement, you know, you get the, th the first movement for this event occurred basically in June um, in there. But the thing that struck out at me was the ridge, the persistence of the ridge in East Central Europe. And that's what allowed the deep trough to form over central, over uh, north of India um, in there. And it kept getting reinforced. So the, 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 the science question would be, is what, de de time, what determines the time scale of a, of a ridge regime? I mean, I would think that this particular ridge, um, based upon what I've seen in many past years, there was, you're looking about three, four sigma in terms of its time scale. So how did the ridge keep getting reinforced? It's like a top, you know, you, it's spinning, but then it starts to wobble and it gets hit and then it's going spinning again. Somehow this ridge remarkably, was remarkably persistent. Now, the, I, would, I have a suspicion that it's related to the highly amplified flow pattern upstream over Western Europe, uh, which allowed Saharan air to get into the get into the picture and a lot of, keep on ridge building by drawing in very hot air from the Sahara at mid and upper levels of the atmosphere. But that's just pure conjecture. This is the kind of thing where you write an NSF proposal, um, but I'm done writing NSF proposals. Um, you write an NSF proposal and you start tearing it apart and look at it. And then you have to look at, okay, well, is this just a, a one, one and done type of deal or is it an outlier? And, and so on. But a lot of times in my research over my career, when I look at something and say, I think it's original, then I think more carefully. And I see there are a lot of other instances where that happened, I wasn't paying attention. So you have to, you have to sort out that effect when you sort of notice something, well, maybe you should look previously and see if there are other, other instances. Because basically when it comes to the atmosphere and research, everything is hiding in plain sight. All you gotta do is look, it's free. You don't have to pay anything to look. Getting paid, it's good, though. <laughs> <laughs> any, you can always count on Morris. A, a, any other questions? Lance will be here all week. He's up in room 3018, I believe yeah. it is, up in Foothills Lab 3. Um, we have um, still some snacks out there. If you want to come over and keep discussing some of these issues, we'll be here. Um, otherwise, let's thank Lance once again. Thank you all.